stage three. <laughs> I'm here with Babs. She oh, did no. a stunning performance. We're doing this now. <laughs> We're doing this now. I haven't forgot. Don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, shit, shit. I feel like so, I'm on the radio. So, Babs, how was it? Yeah, it was pretty great. We uh, did a really team job uh, in, the be- in the end. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> there's a pool of you. I was like... Oh. I was like, oh, fuck. I have to say, in the wheel, we are doing this because uh, we were both scared of the echelons. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Turned out not to be too bad. No, there were no echelons. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, in the end, really great sprint. Did, uh, came some what's too short, but mm. I think mm. some process is coming through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But pretty cool to be. Yeah, pretty cool. Now, today... New day, we were working yeah. for your GC. I'm really yeah. excited for this. Stage four, here we come. Yeah. The weather is looking nice. Stunning. Yeah, hot. stunning, hot. Excited to have to maybe have some ice on the start line today because yesterday yeah. was a no ice day for me. Yeah. No, same. But yeah. Good and a Coke. Yeah. With Coke in the race. Yes, yes. Oh. It's hectic, it's busy, yeah. but we're yeah. excited. Everybody is already almost hitting us. Yeah, <laughs> the longest day today, 180 something. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Bienvenue au Tour de France, femmes. C'est la quatrième étape. Cahors, Rodé. C'est à toi, Abby. We entered this episode today with an audio diary from Ella Wiley ahead of the race for a change. She chatted with her teammate, Babette Vanderwolf, who's the youngest rider in the race. Before we dive into today's episode, you can join the Escape Collective as a monthly subscriber and get access to all of our content. A monthly subscription will usually only set you back $6.99 US dollars a month, but as a special price, until this Thursday, you can get the first month for just $1.00. Head to escapecollective.com slash join and select a monthly subscription. Use the code TDF, that's TDF like the Tour de France, to get your first month for only $1. And thanks to everyone who's already a member. Now, let's get to the episode. Matt Deneef. Abby Mickey. We are here <laughs> <laughs> at stage four of the Tour de France Femme Avec Zwift. We are I want to set the scene. Today. Yeah, please do. Please we're do. Standing, we're sitting in front of a nice little cafe pizza restaurant. That also does karaoke. <laughs> um, we've just got a glass of wine. That's nice. And we're in front of a, a really large red red brick church. Yeah. I, I don't know how you describe this. We're, we're missing our resident architecture expert this evening, unfortunately. Um, hope, Kate, you're feeling better. Yeah, check out the photos online of the uh, church in Rodez. It's beautiful. We, we witnessed a bike race today. It was a really exciting bike race. It was 177 kilometers worth of bike racing and a lot happened. So we're going to attempt to dig into it. Cheers first. Cheers. <laughs> Where should we start? Ooh, breakaway, I think. I think we should start with the stage winner because I okay. feel like she <laughs> deserves to be like up right and center. Sure. In order to get to her, I think we should talk about the breakaway. Okay. We got there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 14 riders got up the road, which is a bigger group than I think many people expected would get up the road. And they got a gap of more than 10 minutes, which was bigger than, again, that I think many people expected. Um, we had most of the teams represented up there. SD Works had a rider up there. Um, and they worked really well together. And, um, yeah, I don't think the peloton really had them under control at any point during the day. And... A rider from the breakaway ended up taking it, Yara Castelline, uh, with a, a wonderful late attack on the second last climb, uh, capping off what's been an amazing few days for her Phoenix to Kunic team. Yeah, I think the breakaway was really interesting in that it there was a couple of smaller moves that went before the big break got any distance from the peloton. And it was a lot of the same characters that we've seen the last couple days trying to get up there. I mean, we saw Yara Castlein already on the attack earlier in the race, trying to go for that QOM jersey. We've seen Anuska Koster has been on the attack a lot for Uno X, and she was up there as well. 
I was really excited to see Audrey Cordon Rago in the break, and I actually I got a chance to chat with her before the stage about a completely different story, um, which I'm going to slot a little bit of the audio in here because I feel it's so good. I feel that it is worth a little detour from the bike racing chat. So let's just listen to that really quick for a second. Indulge me. So I wanted to chat with you about our conversation last night about Thibaut Pino. Yeah. You're you're very popular on the roads. Yeah, I don't know why, actually. Um, probably because I'm one of the oldest uh, rider uh, on the field and uh, I've been there for a while, so people start to know me a little bit. But I also think uh, this second uh, tour uh, is a bit different than last year because people are coming because they know the riders when last year they were coming because they were curious, you know. So you can see like a different public uh, of uh, people really knowing about us. So I think it also makes a, a huge difference. And uh, and yeah, I, I am probably talking a lot in the media about women's cycling. So people know like, oh, she's the one always opening her mouth. <laughs> and And yeah, some people like it, some people don't. But it is what it is. <laughs> so you told me last night that you want to be like the female Thibaut Pino. Why is that? Yeah, I think all the Frenchies want to be the, the female Thibaut Pino because first of all, he's talented on the bike. He's been a really great rider. And uh, and yeah, when you see the this last stage in the Vosges with all those people in this corner, I was at massage at the same time and watching it and I had the goosebumps on my arms. I was like, whoa. Next year will be my last tour and I wish I had the same like somewhere in France with those people coming for me. Um, that's, I, I, I guess that's Tay's dream, but still it was something very special and uh, only Thibaut Pinot can bring this. Do you feel a, a growth in passion for women cycling this year versus last year versus the year before? Yeah, definitely. People know our names, which is something special. Um, we still have to improve that because I think uh, more than just uh, watching at the race, they need to watch at the riders. And uh, this is the next step in tour, I think. But it's it's starting, so I have good hopes and uh, I'm pretty positive about it. You just subtly snuck in that next year is your last Tour de France. Yeah, for sure. Have you announced it yet? Yeah, I'm starting to, to say it. Uh, but I also see a lot of riders like telling that they're gonna retire and in the end I've been signing for another year so I don't want to be this kind of rider so I prefer not talking so much about it because you never know what can happen but uh, still I have some projects I wish I have a family soon and uh, and yeah I'm also like I, I feel like when I see children I really want my children so it's it's pretty difficult for me right now to not think about it. Do you have any aspirations to get some goats? Yeah, actually, I always said to Thibaut, like I express it in the media, that I was, I could be a goat sitting whenever he wants. So I have space enough in my garden. I can have them, look for them for a week, uh, no problem. And uh, yeah, for sure, I'm an animal lover. So I will have some animals when I retire. So all we need to get for you is some goats, a, a theme song, yeah. And maybe a cameo on a Netflix series. Yeah. And my other dream is to, um, in my second life, be a cow in a mountain. Okay. I really love it. I love that for you. Yeah. Oh, the freedom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And beautiful highs. <laughs> okay. So Audrey was up there, which was awesome to see. And then, yeah, I think they got so much time that at one point, Audrey was the virtual leader on the road. And as SC Works... I wouldn't say work to bring the break back, but we'll get to that in a second. They had, they did put some riders on the front as they kind of got into that tail end with the final three climbs and the bonus climb with the seconds on it and everything. They they put some riders up there to work, but when the gap really started to plummet, it was because Lota Kopecky started attacking. And at that point, Audrey wasn't the virtual leader on the road. It was Yara Kastlein. Mm. Yep. And I think uh, there was, we were standing around the finish line at the, the media tent past the finish and I know you and I were pretty confused about what was going on and I think that was the feeling amongst others as well. Not really sure what Kopecky was up to. I think she attacked five times from the coverage that I was looking at uh, to try and get away and eventually got sort of 30 seconds up the road by herself but then got brought back by a group of the GC favourites um, including her teammate uh, Demi Vollering. Um, so a lot of effort expended for not a whole lot of um, gain 
although she did end up in back in the yellow jersey at the end of the day, uh, managed to pull that back from Castelline. So I guess they achieved their goal, but it was a bit of a strange one seeing how it all played out on the road there. Yeah, and multiple riders actually said after the race that SC Works were deploying some pretty weird tactics. Uh, we have an audio diary from Ashley Moenpasio, who was obviously on the ground in the mix, not attacking so much as just kind of following moves, but she also had a teammate up there who was in the breakaway from the beginning and then faded back to, to help Ash kind of like maintain her spot. So let's hear that really quick. Hey Abby, uh, so today was perfect display of teamwork and the power of the Wolfpack. Uh, Romy did an incredible job getting into the early breakaway, which got a fairly sizable gap. Um, there was quite a lot of confusion in the peloton, uh, you know, whether we would catch it or not. But we obviously um, did nothing to chase. Um, we wanted to put all the pressure on SD Works, of course, because they're defending uh, yellow. Um, they didn't <laughs> seem to do the best of jobs of bringing it back. And yeah, it was also interesting to see how um, they were you know, chasing each other down <laughs> at the end of the day. So once again, the interesting uh, tactics from SD Works, uh, which of course meant that uh, we didn't catch uh, the breakaway entirely, obviously mostly, but not entirely. Uh, so yeah, congrats again to uh, Phoenix de Koenig or de Koenig Phoenix, <laughs> who are racing uh, really well here at the Tour de France Femme of X Swift. Um, and yeah, um, it was a good day for me. I felt strong, um, especially in the steeper parts. Um, when Demi and Anamik got a gap, that, that was more sort of as the climb flattened out. Um, but I was so happy to have uh, Romy up the road who could uh, wait for me at the top of the second last climb and then help to bring it all back for the final. And then, yeah, nothing uh, major lost today. Of course, get Demi gets the benefit of a few seconds, um, but there's still some really hard racing to come. And now full focus on the final weekend uh, with the Tourmalé and the time trial. But of course, we do have two stages before we get there. Um, so I know I can rely on my teammates to look after me. And yeah, we'll just remain attentive to make sure that um, nothing happens in the GC over the next two days. At the end of the race, Elise Longaborghini also commented on the weird tactics of SC Works. So it's interesting that it's kind of becoming a theme. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we've seen in the last few months this frustration with SD Works in the peloton. I remember speaking to Grace Brown about this a few months ago and her kind of despairing at the fact. But in the last week, with SD Works' dominance at the race, we're starting to see more and more frustration quite visibly and quite... Uh, publicly I guess with these comments that are being made it seems like most of the peloton is pretty fed up with SD Works not only, not only the fact that they're winning so much but just their tactics and, and a lot of riders aren't afraid to to call them out for it yeah yesterday we had like this weird situation where SD Works wouldn't work and so DSM was forced to work and today the entire peloton got together and we're like nope <laughs> <laughs> yeah which is kind of cool to see you know as you said SD Works put a few riders up there to chase at various times um, and it was only yeah when Kopecky kind of went to the front the yellow jersey chasing that the major inroads were made um, I'm really curious to see how it plays out over the next few days you know we've still got the tourmalade obviously later in the race but there's a few stages between now and then and sprint stages where a break's likely to get up the road and how is SD Works going to handle it? How's the Peloton going to handle that? Um, are we going to see a similar situation to yesterday with DSM? Uh, it's, yeah, intriguing few days ahead, I think, in that regard. You you mentioned that mm, when we were standing at the finish line wondering, what is Kopecky doing? Mm. I did. No. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I missed your opportunity to, to use your own joke there. I think you should, uh, you should drop it in. <laughs> she was doing a lot of things. Um, that, <laughs> that maybe she was burning some energy ahead of the stages tomorrow and uh, the next two stages where she'll be needed and any help that she can give Volering on the Tourmalet. And I pointed out that it seems like at the moment she's riding maybe 5% better than the rest of the peloton. And if she wastes 2% of her energy, mm. she's still got, you know, 3% better than the rest of the peloton. I mean, she looks, she looked amazing out there. Yeah, so good. On the climbs, she was so strong. I think this was a stage that I wrote earlier in the race that 
this might be a challenging one for her potentially with those climbs but the way she's climbing at the moment it's pretty incredible um yeah i wonder if it will have an impact on the, the next few days for her uh you know she's been an important part of the, the lead out for webus and yeah i don't know it was a curious one she said in her press conference afterwards that she was trying to get up the road so that she could be there to help volering in the final uh, mm -hmm. on the steep climb and in the run into that um, that didn't end up happening um, so she had a plan but it, it was a bit of a strange one yeah it was there was definitely something going on but i don't think the su works is going to tell us what they were trying to do <laughs> once they once they did start to close that gap and it was clear that the breakaway was going to win but the yellow jersey was going to stay on the shoulders of Kapeki. We started to see a really interesting game play out in the general classification riders that were left. There was a lot of GC riders that were kind of, I don't know, third tier favorites. Like, ooh, they might get up in there, they might not. They kind of lost the spark today. And what emerged at the end of the day was a situation where we saw Vollering on top with Van Vluten right there, right next to her. And then a handful of other riders like hovering close to them. And I think what was most interesting to me today about that situation was the final climb. Van Vluten couldn't hold on to Vollering. Van Vluten got distance and it yeah. was really steep. steep. Yeah. Yeah, and we saw early in the stage, didn't we, that Vollering attacked and Van Vluten had trouble coming across. She managed to eventually and then actually put in an attack of her own. But on the climb that mattered, the one to the finish, uh, yeah, Vollering was able to put some, some distance into Van Vluten and not only finished a couple seconds ahead on the stage, but then also picked up um, a time bonus. So I think she extends her lead. Well, she now moves eight seconds ahead of Van Vluten, which, yeah, we keep talking about the Tourmalet. That's the big one. And... Eight seconds there isn't a whole lot, but it might it might well make a difference. You never know, and I think Vollering will be happy happier having eight seconds to the good rather than to the bad after today's stage. And if for no other reason than she'll take some confidence from climbing so well and being able to distance Van Vluten on that climb. I think for me, one of the most interesting comments that came out of all of the quotes from after the race today was Demi said that. Normally, she can drop people on a climb, but today she couldn't. Today, she managed a couple times to get away from Kashini Wadoma, Elise Longa Borghini, but, and Ashley Monpasio, but at the end of the day, they, they made it back to her. They always made it back to her, and she was surprised that she couldn't drop them, that she couldn't distance them today. Yeah, and I, I think the thing that I have in mind is that while we did get the first glimpses of the GC riders really attacking each other today. The climbs today weren't really indicative of what's coming ahead. Again, back to the Tourmalet, it's such a long climb compared to anything we've seen so far in this race. So while Vollering mightn't have been able to drop them in any significant way today, I don't think we've really got a clear idea yet of what that's going to mean on the, the race's biggest climb. I think, for me, I'm super impressed with how Ash is riding. She... Not only today was she very steady throughout all of the attacks because multiple riders said the final 20K was just insane. It was just attack after attack. It was completely relentless. And she kept her head. She stayed in the mix. But she also didn't waste any energy. Like, we, we saw Kasha again on the attack today. God love her. But, we, but Ash and Elise Longa Ruggini, both of them, played a really smart game today. Yeah, it's a long race, isn't it? There's a lot still to come. I'm just disappointed that Ash didn't do better than seventh because I had her in the fantasy competition uh, of escape. So um, she's let me down there, which is disappointing. Uh, but hopefully I'll be able to rally in the days ahead. You know what's wild is I haven't used Kopecky yet. Wow. But unfortunately for you, she's used up all her energy today, so she's going to be rubbish for the rest of the race. No, she's got 3% still. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, in, in terms of the GC, Kapeki is still leading Demi by 43 seconds. And then there's that that group, that group that just like can't s seem to break away from each other. Ash Kasha, Elise Longo Argini, and Anouk Van Fluten that are all 41 seconds behind Kapeki. So eight seconds behind Demi. So it's still, yeah, I like you said, eight seconds doesn't seem like a lot when the Tourmalet looms. But those two are really close in ability. So that will... We'll yeah. see how that goes. Yeah, it's very true. And uh, Yara Castellan, today's stage winner, 
is now up into seventh place. I think she moved up something like 25 places on the day. Um, she's now a minute behind and she's a strong climber, obviously, as we've seen in the last few days. So that puts her in a good position. Um, I'm sure she will continue to fight for the QOM jersey. She was disappointed not to get it today, but I think uh, she'll take how today panned out. I, I want to talk a bit more about Castline and her win and uh, a piece you wrote for the Escape Collective website. I want to talk a little bit about Castline and what this win means to her team and her. But before we get to that, I want to hear from Veronica Ewers, who was an outside favorite going into the race and didn't have a bad day today, but maybe is feeling the effects of the Giro Tour double as such a young rider in terms of how long she's been in the sport. And especially because the day was 177 racing kilometers. It was a long day for someone who it's their second year racing. And interestingly, when it comes to the, the length, well, we'll get to it. Let's, let's hear from Veronica. Eight, uh, stage four done, longest stage. Um, actually went by fairly quickly, which was nice. Um, my teammate Catherine was in the break that basically stayed away all day. Um, and she got ninth, which is really awesome. Um, yeah, it was an interesting day. Um, yeah, the break had about 10 minutes on the Peloton for a bit. Um, and then it was interesting to see which teams would chase. Um, I think there were some, yeah, there was some discussion amongst a few teams, but it didn't really uh, come to fruition in time. Um, and then once it started getting quite hilly, um, the first uh, 6K or 4.6K climb, yeah, it started getting hard and started, started to wean out the peloton a bit. And then it just went pretty full gas from there. Um, yeah. So, uh, I personally didn't have the legs or the ability to hang with the main hitters of the bunch. Um, but yeah, so that wasn't great, but I'm stoked for my teammate, Katrin, and super cool that Yara won, um, out of that break. Um, and yeah, uh, long day is over onto the back half of the tour. An interesting thing about the length actually is that I think every journalist I overheard talking to a rider asked about that. And every rider was like, we train this much. Like it's not, I feel like the the length is, conversation is one that we can put to bed. Yeah, it, it feels that way, doesn't it? We had this discussion last year when there was a long stage of the tour. We've had it again this year when there's an even longer stage. The response both times is kind of like, yeah, it's fine, we are able to do this distance and that's kind of it, you know. I, and now that there's been a bunch of kind of boring answers to it and there's not much to it, yeah, let's move on. <laughs> uh, not boring though, Yara Castline. Yeah, she, very exciting rider. Yeah, very exciting rider who actually, she's been around for a while. She was on WOW deals with Mariana Voss when that team was around. She was on Rabobank Live for a bit. So she's been around for, for a while, but is kind of having like a resurgence with the Phoenix Takunik team. And you wrote a piece on the vibes. I did. Yeah, I went and hung out at the Phoenix Takunik bus after the stage. I quite like doing this after a team's won a stage, just go and hang out the bus and wait for the team staff to come in and then the riders kind of come in one by one. Uh, so that's what I did today and when I got there it was very quiet at the bus, they were still kind of setting up and then the staff started arriving and a guy runs up the stairs and into the bus and just yells at the top of his voice like a, a huge you know, Yahoo kind of thing and big hugs around and with everyone and over the next little while, the riders started coming in, the staff started coming in, and just seeing that that joy from the team, um, you're just reminded of how much this means to not just the riders, but the the staff that have you know put so much into this, and um, also reminded of just how much of a team sport this is. I know that sounds obvious, but 
it's it's Castellone winning the stage and getting the plaudits to go with that. But this means a whole lot to her team and. Um, I was glad I was able to capture some of that energy in the piece that I wrote. I've put some videos in that piece that, you know, you can see people celebrating, uh, which I think really helps illustrate it. And, uh, yeah, just a really touching moment to see how much it meant to all of them. And uh, particularly for one of the smaller teams in the race, one of the, the newer World Tour teams, it's their first year in the World Tour. And they came to this race wanting to just really attack and really show themselves and try to be there in the fight. And... They've really done that with the the fight for the QOM jersey, and yesterday they got so close with Julie van der Velder, and then today they went one better with uh, with a fantastic win. So, yeah, really great to see that and to see how much it meant to them. I think for me, one of the best parts of the whole post race celebrations was seeing her and her mom at the finish. Uh, that was her mom was very emotional, and she was. She wasn't crying, but I think that you could tell how much it meant to have her family there to see this win. It's such a monumental win. And yeah, for sure. Her mum's there and her dad's there as well, and apparently her brother's arriving uh, in a little while as well. So, yeah, that, that would really add to the experience. I think we we had a similar thing last year with Demi Vollering's family at the top of the Planche de Belfi, I remember, and I remember talking about that just how how much that would heighten the experience you know of, you know you work so hard your family puts in so much effort over the years to to get you to where you are as a pro athlete and then to to be able to celebrate with them in your biggest moment I think that's that's a very special thing I I want to throw to a couple more audio diaries if that's okay with you Matt I'll allow it <laughs> I went overboard but I'm not mad about it <laughs> We got some really good ones today from Lucinda Brand, who was in the breakaway, having a great time. The first part of the audio diary is about her time in the breakaway. The second part of her audio diary is apparently a story from the breakaway that makes sense to no one but those who are in the breakaway. So let's hear from <laughs> Lucinda Brand. <laughs> uh, Lucinda here again. Um, day four? Four. Uh, yeah, it was breakaway day. I uh, after the first uh, climb, we thought, well, it's a short day. Let's take it. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we, we had to quite uh, ride hard to get the gap. But that once we got the gap, we had 10 minutes. So we actually could enjoy a really nice view in the first kilometers. So if you ever look for a nice place in France, go look at the map and point it out. It's really nice to ride your bike there. And... Um, next dead yeah well um <laughs> it was basically waiting till the final when the climbs got harder and my legs less good <laughs> so i knew it was gonna be really hard to stay take a stage win of course you need to keep believing it but um yeah it was not for me today unfortunately and um <clears throat> yeah even the strongest dc riders um catch me on the final and I think uh, Elisa did a good job staying with them or at uh, almost like one two seconds and um, yeah um, that's it for today I think actually yeah actually I forgot something in part one so we have part two here it was really funny on the way some people were advocating <laughs> to get rid of a French TV journalist of course I could not read the French message but my French speaking uh, company was uh, really laughing hard <laughs> and they explained me the message so apparently this <laughs> this journalist is not uh, um, really uh, uh, happy with uh, by everybody and they ask to please uh, quit his job <laughs> <laughs> so it, I found it funny. Another rider who was in the breakaway today, Audrey Cordon Rago. Not only did I get to chat with her this morning, I also got an audio diary. Let's hear from Audrey. How lucky Hopefully are you? not from the bathroom today. <laughs> hey Javi. Um yeah, it was nice to see you actually before the start. Yeah, well, um what a day. I mean um, was the plan actually from the team to to try to be in the break and uh, we wanted to be at least with two and um, we wanted to play Barbara's card Malcotti because she's a really good climber and 
considering the the end of the stage we thought was better for her but didn't work out the way we wanted so i ended up being alone there and plan b was on and uh, plan b was i was the best on gc in the group so we took a lot of time and then uh, yellow jersey was becoming possible um so yeah from there i started to believe in it and and try to motivate everyone to 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 collaborate but you know um yeah the the, the funny thing is that we have 10 minutes and we don't make it to the end and i mean only one of us is making to making it to the end in front of the all those leaders so it's pretty crazy because i think something like this in men's cycling would would go to the end um but it is what it is and yeah i was kind of disappointed after the line like because I was also super tired, you know, and it's kind of mixed feelings. But now that I'm taking a bit more perspective, it's a couple of hours later, um, I think I had a good day, I felt strong, and most of all, I had such goosebumps uh, hearing all those people cheering for me. It was unbelievable. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. It was very special. And I'm I'm so sad that I cannot thanks everyone, but I think everyone was quite happy for me that I could be in the front and I, they were believing in the fact that I could make it also to the yellow jersey. So yeah, it's been a special day on the tour today and uh, it's not finished. So let's try to, to, to have another day like this. All right, so two more audio diaries from today. We have Vittoria Guazzini of the FDJ Suez team who sent in an audio diary, and then Jess Allen was Lanton Rouge. Hey, mate. And I sent her a message, hey, you don't have to send me an audio diary if you had a rough day. And she sent me back a chipper audio diary. <laughs> she had a great day out She's there. She's a gem. Hi, Escape and Abby. Uh, first stage of Tour de France. We are halfway through the tour. Today it's been a really, really long day on the saddle. Uh, never done so many kilometers all together because it was a long stage plus the neutral so in the end it was a lot and uh, yeah we are a bit disappointed that we missed the breakaway because uh, almost every team had someone at the front so of course it wasn't the best uh, situation for us um, at some point Grace was in the middle uh, with some other girls but I think yeah uh, they didn't have good uh, cooperation so in the end they stopped and after we decided to uh, let it up to as they work to chase because yeah they they've won almost several races this year so we thought it was their job to chase um, uh, for me yeah as i said it was really really long in the end i had no more legs i was so exhausted but uh, yeah it's uh, one day less to go and uh, hopefully tomorrow again better feeling and uh, yeah i dropped on the yeah with about 40 k's to go uh so yeah it's not the best but it's not even the worst if i think about two days ago where i was and uh, tomorrow's stage will be another very important one uh if i have to be honest i'm not uh I'm not very very prepared yet with the course of the of uh, tomorrow's stage. Uh, for now, I just think about recovering from today. But yeah, for sure we are hungry for more because today we came away with not so much, and we know we we can do a lot more. So we are motivated to do good even tomorrow. Hey mate, I was actually just about to uh, send you a voice note. Yeah, today wasn't too bad actually. Um, yeah, break went, big break went. Unfortunately, we weren't in it. Um, but at the same time, meant most of the girls could have a pretty chill day today. Um, we don't have a, a super strong climbing team here. So um, Anna did her best at the end there and uh, she's gone really well. So um, we hope to support her as well in the next few days. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was probably the longest race I think I've ever done, um, as for most people and yeah, super hard finale and, um, that was it really. Um, 
yeah, we've just moved hotels, really nice place on a golf course. Um, and yeah, I thought I'd give you a bit of insight actually into like some of the staff we've had here. Um, the first few days we worked with a uh, sleep specialist. Um, she worked with us at Tour Down Under as well. Her, her name's Elise uh, and she works with some of Jerry Ryan's uh, sporting teams. And so uh, it was actually really good to, uh, to have her on board and she gave us some like sleep techniques and we've been using like sleep glasses um, at night like because like the stage is finished quite late and then just to help wind down a bit. So like we actually like wear them to dinner and then before we go to sleep um, and then just have like some uh, special lights we put on in the room, like turn all the big lights off and just have these like red lights on. Um, and I think it's actually been working really well. Like Anna, she's Spanish and she normally goes to bed super late and she's been sleeping really well and everyone's been sleeping really well and falling asleep quite easy which can be quite difficult after late stages and when people have caffeine as well. So uh, that's been really cool. Um, so I just thought I'd give you a bit of insight into that and what we've been doing off the bike. And yeah, hope you're well. I also told Jess about all the requests for a Hey Mate for like text message notifications. And she had this to say. <laughs> Mate, that's actually class. <laughs> Although that would be the most annoying thing ever, just me be like, hey, mate. <laughs> okay, Matt. It's time, is it? It was a big day today, and I think before we talk about tomorrow, because I need to decompress okay. how the day went, we're going to hear a little bit of history from Jose Bain. Today we're going to take a look at the Cathars, who had a stronghold in the town of Albi in the Middle Ages. We are now racing in the old French region of Occitania and you will spot the red flags with the Occitan cross immediately on the side of the road. The region is more a cultural and a language entity than a political one and although the administrative region now bears the name Occitania, in history there was never one Occitania. Like Bretagne, where they speak Breton, the Occitan language is not recognized by the French government but is widely spoken in the region and many signs are bilingual. Occitania was also home to the Cathars. The other name was Albigensens, named after a Finnish town of Albi where they had a stronghold. The Albigensians formed a Christian community in the 13th century that opposed the teachings and hierarchy of the Catholic Church. They were fiercely opposed by the Catholic Church through prayer, but also by military punitive expeditions. Their teaching is based on the eternal battle between the spiritual and the carnal, the good and the bad, or God and Satan. The human soul can be delivered from the grip of the diabolical flesh by a baptism of the spirit, so there was no water involved. And whoever has undergone such an initiation is subject to a strict discipline of poverty, fasting and sexual abstinence. They are called the perfecti. Luckily for mankind, not many of the Albigensians made it to the baptism because only the perfecti were deemed good enough. If everybody would have gotten to the baptism stage, sexual abstinence would have automatically led to the end of the Cathars. Well, the Catholic popes were not really impressed and they wanted to end this, what they called, cult. There were many crusades against the Cathars who not only resisted the wealth of the Catholic Church, but also claimed that their Christianity was the purest form. Cathar comes from kataros, which in Greek means pure. The first crusade by Pope Alexander III was in 1179. They did destroy some areas around Albi and then returned back home. Pope Innocent III decided to take real strong action against the Cathars. In 1209, he managed to rally an army for a crusade to Occitania. In 1229, Albi was returned to the French crown, as were most cities in the Cathar region. After three crusades, the crusaders finally attacked the imported castle of Montségur, which was the final stronghold of the Albigensians. It's about two hours south of Albi. At Christmas of 1243, a party of 
6,000 besiegers in total climbed up and seized the watchtower that stood on the hill at the far end of the plateau where the castle was built. Then they were finally able to install their tribute ship, which then started launching stone bullets at the fortifications of the village. About one month later, so in 1244, gaps appeared in the defences and the inhabitants could do little more than surrender. On March 1st, 1244, the leader of the defending troops negotiated with the attackers and agreed that the lives of the soldiers and the non-Cathars would be spared. And this is also applied to the Cathars who would give up their faith. The Cathars who did not want to give up their faith were given two weeks to prepare for their death. A pyre was then erected on the 16th of March, on which 220 people were put to death. The fortifications and the entire village of Monségur were then razed to the ground, and that was the end of the Albigensen movement in the southwest of France. Tomorrow's stage from Onel le Chateau to Albi. Very good. Yours, I would be proud. 126.1 kilometers long with three categorized climbs. It goes 334. There's some bonus seconds thrown in there for good measure at 91 kilometers into the stage. And then it's kind of a downhill run to the finish. Yep, sprint stage. Yeah, we'll probably, if I had to guess, see a break go up the road and yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether we have a repeat of the other day with the SD Works versus DSM Dynamics, um, how the peloton handles that, how the sprint teams handle that, whether we see riders get up the road for QOM points, which I'm sure we will. That's been one of the, the hottest battles so far in the last few days. So, yeah, all, when all's said and done, I think it'll be another sprint finish, and I think you'd have to pick Weebus. But I'll be picking Charlotte Cole because I've already used Weavis in my Escape Collective Fantasy competition. Unbelievable. Making, we're gonna, you're making me talk about it again. I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of sorry. I'm not really sorry. You know what's interesting about this stage is similar to stage two, it starts with some climbing out of the gate and then it kind of plateaus and descends and then you get to the actual categorized climbs on the route. And I bookmarked this stage as a breakaway day, but I think given how today finished... I have to rewrite my daily preview for tomorrow's stage because two breakaway days and one in, in back to back is not not on my 2023 bingo card. So how do you think it'll play out? I think it's going to be a sprint, and I'm going for Voss. Okay. I think she looked that. really good. Yep. On on stage three. And I think that she's riding into form in this tour. Yep. Also, yes. people love the vibes and the color. So I just want to add that Voss's parents are following the race in their camper van. And because her brother takes the photos, they've got a press yeah. sticker on their camper van, which is really funny because you roll into the press parking lot and there's like a, like a camper van with two elderly Dutch people sitting out front. <laughs> Maybe we should try and speak to them some point. I think that my biggest story this week is going to be a day in the life of Demi's dog. Yeah. That uh, sounds great. She's a very good dog. Hanging out at the finish today. Just yeah. patiently waiting for mom to notice her. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah, definitely do that story. You know what we didn't talk about at all today was Demi thinking she won the stage. Yeah, that's true. She kind of gave a half-hearted salute, I would say. She sort of saluted and then kind of like shrugged. Saluted like Saluted just in case? Yeah, saluted just in case, but also not enough just in case she hadn't won, so she didn't want to be fully embarrassed. But you were saying she had a good line to the press at the bus afterwards. She did. Afterwards, she asked the press to please delete those pictures. <laughs> so she, she took it in stride, I think. Yeah, that's good. That's what you want. But yeah, after after a pretty hard stage day, the GC riders get a little bit of a break, and I think it'll turn turn to the sprinters or maybe some opportunistic riders. I don't think we can ride a break off. Oh, that'll make it interesting, and if we see another situation like we did yesterday with you know a break almost surviving, I think that'll be pretty cool. Very much, very much cool. <laughs> okay, you're gonna make me f talk about the fantasy competition. Yep. Who's winning the league, Matt? Our league, the Escape Collective team. The Escape Collective crew. Uh, it's still me. 
Shocker. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm being chased by uh, a handful of people, actually, very close behind. So I'm going to, again, make the most of my opportunity to brag about this. Um, this might be my last day in yellow, I think. So, uh, yep, it's been, a, it's been a good run. But Can he hold it to the tourmalade? <laughs> no. Spoiler alert, no. It's all downhill from here. Um, but in the overall, Julius Still. Pepwood. Still. Your boy, Magic. Canadian. <laughs> he didn't pick the winner today, though. First time for everything. First time for everything. He picked Annemiek van Vluten today. So, an eight points rather than the full 15, but mm. enough to hold on to the lead. But there are four people in very close pursuit, three points behind. Dan Stone, Emily, Martin, and Tears of Pino uh, on 50 Tears points. Tears of Pino? Yeah, Tears of Pino. What a sad name. A sad name, but also a good name. So it's yeah, it's getting close, and then a whole bunch of people just a few points behind. So after a, a, a big early lead, uh, Julius Pepwood is being closed in on from behind, and that competition will heat up in the days ahead, I'm sure. Well, I have tomorrow to exact my revenge. I made a huge leap in the crew competition today uh, with my pick of Annemiek Van Bluten. I thought it was a safe pick. I really thought she would try a long-range attack, but I should have known better. Tomorrow's a new day. She did try a long-range attack. It just didn't work. It, I mean, c'est la vie. We'll be back tomorrow to talk about Stage 5 of the Tour de France Femme of X-Swift on the Escape Collective podcast feed. I'm Abby Mickey. I'm Matt Deneuf. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.